Welcome to the Content Creator's Guide. This is a place where we expand our knowledge on what it takes to be successful in an ever-expanding world of content creation. Join me as I sit down with individuals sharing their success stories and tips that help them get over the hurdles they faced on their journey to creation success. All right, let's create. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Content Creator's Guide. I will be your host, Patrick Conway, also known in other circles as Jaxus. Today we will be talking to the creator, writer, director, and actor of both The Modus Files and actor in The Last Days of Appalachia, which is over 40,000 downloads. He is also an actor in Once Upon a Wasteland, a Fallout story. Please give a warm welcome to Lawrence McNamara, the Enclave Operator. Awesome. My, my little Very sound happy effect. To be here. Huh? Oh, yeah. I said, now happy to be here. <laughs> Thanks for coming to the show. I hope you're comfortable. This is my first run at all of this. That's why I'm going to say um like 900 times. So let's go ahead and get right into the meat of this. Uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you was what inspired you to become a content creator? So I've always, I've always written. So even when I was very young, I would, um, even when I had like like the the old word processors, who were wasn't even a computer, it was actually like a typewriter that you could actually um, that was like a half typewriter, half word processor, and I had a really great imagination and I wanted to tell stories, so I just literally started typing out. And, and what's funny is that I actually have a couple of notebooks on the side of my bookcase of some of my old writings back when I was. I like love all the 12. little guys sitting on the shelves there, by the way. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> this, is, this is my work background as well. So when I have like conference calls at work, like this is what people see. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, at some point I'll, I'll take you on a tour around my office here or the, or the production studio. But um, so I always wanted to tell a story. And, you know, as time went on, I wrote less and less because I became an adult. But you know, once I started getting into Fallout 76 again, I was inspired by the story and started coming up with characters. And then, of course, COVID hit and I started writing like full time. And I ended up with about 900 pages and two volumes of what ultimately would become the Modus Files. And it was a, it was a story following the characters in the game that we had created, me and a small group of friends. And... I really felt like I needed to get this out into the community that I wanted to create something that people could enjoy. And originally it was going to be a series of novels. Um, but then I happened to run across uh, Ken from the uh, Chad podcast. Oh, and familiar with him. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I had a couple of conversations with him. He actually invited me to the aristocracy or apocalyptic and aristocracy discord. And one thing I found out is that, Publishing something based on an IP is difficult because companies don't like it when you make money off of their property. And he said, you should do a podcast. Bethesda likes podcasts and you're not really intruding on their IP. You know, any money you would make would be minimal. You should do that. And that scared the heck out of me because I would be putting some, I would be putting my own voice out in front of you know, potentially an audience. I don't know if anybody would ever, ever actually listen to it. Um, but I finally bit the bullet and I was like, you know what? Fine. I'll, I'll go ahead and do this. So I literally took that, that big 900 pages and I, I took like the first 30, 35 minutes of it, turned it into a very rough script, horrible looking script. I, I don't want anybody to ever see it because it's just really bad. And it was literally just me in front of my laptop. Nothing like what you've sent me. <laughs> right. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, it was, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, this was very, very early days and, and I just did it. And I, I figured out how to do a website, figured out how to get the podcast out there. So for me, you know, kind of getting back to the heart of the question, why did I want to become a creator? I wanted to be able to just tell a story and I felt like I had something that I needed to contribute or that I wanted to contribute. Not, not that I needed to per se, but yeah, I, I just wanted to. And I'm, I'm glad that I did because it's been an incredible journey. I perfectly understand that. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm on that same journey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so what was, what was one of the hardest hurdles getting started for you and how did you overcome it? So the hardest the, the the hardest thing was actually what kind of story did I want to tell? I mean, and when I say that, 
the, the story was going to be what it was, mm -hmm. but how did I actually want to present it? Right. Because, you know, if you think about, if you think about um, listening to like a book on tape, it's one person speaking. Now they may change their voice to denote different characters, but it's usually just one person. Yeah, in audiobook form. Yeah, an audiobook form. Yeah. So my choice was, do I do it in audiobook form, where literally I am the narrator and all of the characters, or do I dramatization or, or, like Star Wars does them? That was perfect. Yeah, turn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do, yeah, do I want to do an audio drama where I actually have a cast? So understanding that I wanted to actually bring people in and have them voice these characters was extremely difficult because. As a writer, you do not have to worry about how many characters you have. You could have a thousand characters mm -hmm. because it's one, it's literally one voice and it's not even a voice. It's, it's pages in print. But once you actually have to verbalize them, suddenly it's, oh my goodness, I've got like 20 people talking right now. How am I going to do this? So threading that needle of bringing in a cast, but also then limiting the number of characters that you present in a way that you're still showing a, a larger world, but you don't need to have 50 people submitting lines or, or or being a part of it. So for me, that was the hardest part. And it just was really just a measure of experience getting through that and deciding that there was an upper limit. You know, I mean, I'm going to be bringing in more characters over time, but there really is an upper limit of like 13, 14, maybe 15 people in any given episode, because just once so you, you get beyond get over that- Oh, it gets so difficult. I mean, people yeah. really don't understand how much time and effort actually has to go into one of these episodes. It is an arduous process in a lot of in a lot of cases, especially when you're one person operation like myself, where I'm literally the one sitting in front of the computer and laying in all of the lines and then doing the sound effects. And, you know, it's 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 really difficult. And the more people that you have to try to lay in, that just increases the complexity. Um, many, many times. So that kind of comes into my next question is, um, what have you found works best for you, uh, for your type of show in regard to like mic and sound quality? Obviously, you know, dealing with different actors and things like that, the quality is not always the best coming in. So, you know, uh, what, what, what do you think works best for you in that regard? You know, like, I guess I should say is, uh, it actually leads into the question I had next, which probably don't need to is, uh, what would you recommend for editing your show? Yeah. Well, I think that it, so it, so I think maybe I'll answer the second one first, which is um, definitely something like audition from Adobe, but I actually use audacity, which is a, which is a free program that I downloaded. Yeah. I um, use that as well. I, yeah. I've been told that audition is, is better, but I started in audacity. And when I tried to upgrade to audition, I didn't understand any of the features or functionality. So I, I ultimately Became canceled that. Great. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. just, you know, because I, I, I've over time and I'm, I'm completely self-taught by the way, I've, I've never done, I never did sound editing before, never did any of that. So this was really like a babe in the woods moment for me, which is just like, oh my goodness, what the heck am I doing? Um, even going back and listening to my first episode, it was like, I could hear things that nowadays I would actually eliminate using the program. Now, Audacity is great because it has a bunch of different plugins that you can get. So it allows you to, um, you know, do noise reduction. It allows you to do um, sound equalization. You know, you can do a lot of interesting sound effects too, just by doing equalization, putting in reverb. Like when I discovered how to create like a megaphone effect, like a, a like a, I just about died. I thought that was the most fantastic thing in the world. <laughs> um, but for for people that want to do this, um, you definitely need to invest in a, I would say, it doesn't need to be a, a, an actual like studio quality mic, but you need to have like a, a really decent microphone. Like I, I, for instance, I use a, what is this? This is a... If you hold the mic up, uh, I can probably tell you. Sorry. It's a... Uh, that is a Yeti. Yeti. That is a blue Yeti. Yes, yeah. it is. Yes. Yeah. So, so that's actually one of the ones I'm after is I'm trying to get the Blue Yeti Blackout, which is right around $179 if you get it with a boom stand like this is here. Like this guy right here, this is called a Blue Snowball, and it was right around $50. And mm -hmm. I paid another like 18 bucks for the boom and this what's called a uh, pop filter. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's good for a beginner. 
you know, which is me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I, I also, yeah, I, that what you got right there is basically what my next step is. Yeah. So. I mean, I've worked with people that have like a full, like complete setup that they probably spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars on, you know, I mean, it's so, so it really varies, but in general, at least as a creator, what I'm looking for are people who can provide me with their lines, um, Hopefully they've done some kind of noise reduction because that's always like you, I think in general, most people don't quite even in their own lives, don't realize how much background noise there is. Mm -hmm. It's the air conditioner. It's the refrigerator. It's their dishwasher. It's, it's their kids running around upstairs. So you don't need to be locked up in like a soundproof room to record. You do need to have things generally quiet, but like in audacity, for instance, um, you can select like one or two seconds of of quote unquote silence. So so when I ask somebody to give me their lines, I say, hey, can you give me either pauses in between the lines that you're gonna you're gonna give me, or, or give me two or, reduction. Yeah, and or give me two or three seconds of just nothing at the beginning. I'll use that to identify. Okay, everything that's in this section of silence is actually the background noise, and then it will lay that over the the whole track. And it will eliminate that. So I get, even just doing that, it gives me much clearer lines. Now, one person did something, which actually was a mistake I made the first time, was not realizing that you have to select silence. They actually use their entire vocal clip to reduce the noise. <laughs> now, it doesn't eliminate everything. But what no. it does is it basically takes everything below a certain uh, threshold. So everything below like like six or seven or, or 60 or 70, whatever the decibel limit is, and just eliminates it and then you get like that really clipped sounding and it's it's horrible so mm -hmm. yeah so so if you're going to if you're going to read for a, a for any creator whether it's me or, or anybody else um just do your due diligence you know have a decent mic be in a relatively quiet space and if you have the ability to run noise reduction do it because it just sounds so much better and it makes it so much easier on me when i actually have to lay in those lines or um, like you said leave that little break in there so that the other person can do so yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. What about normalization? So I do that um, when necessary because a lot of times uh, people's gain mm -hmm. are, are set differently. And usually, and nowadays, I can actually tell when I look at the sound file, when I actually see the, the peaks right. and valleys, I've I can say, I've to be able to read it myself. Yeah. Yeah. Where you're like, about. okay, I have to run normalization on this. And the out of the box um, audacity normalization is usually fine. Um, I know that I've made a mistake when I when I hit it and and actually the peaks and valleys get higher um, because then it's like oh well it was actually pretty much fine as it was. I'm also not afraid to um, just individually uh, change the gain on on lines. So you know if if someone is speaking very loudly but it's not something I can normalize, I'll just reduce them by like three or four decibels and that's usually fine. Which is kind of me because I'm usually I, I have a very large carrying voice so there's a lot of the times where especially if i'm speaking in an excited way um i need to be normalized down to match up with other people because a lot of other people's microphones don't catch like mine apparently does yeah even though well, it's and, it's, and, <laughs> and it's and it's funny too because one thing that I've, i'm still working on is when people are yelling like when people have to be loud mm -hmm. i'm still figuring out how exactly that should sound because there's you know, there's different environments that your characters are in. So, you know, you could be reading your lines just in your office, but you're actually in the middle of a field or you're in a forest mm -hmm. or you're, you're, you're 300 feet away from the person that you're yelling at. How does that sound to yeah. are you the gonna person have that's that, listening? Hey, you over here, you know, as opposed right. to, Hey, you over here. Right. Yeah. I get exactly what you're talking about there. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, so, and again, that's not necessarily something that the, person reading the lines has to be aware of those in many cases they are it is very um, helpful though when we do yeah know it what's is going you know on, yeah yeah i mean and i think that context contextually i try to give the people that are reading the lines the whole script so that they can see what's going on it helps so me. that yeah it, so that yeah. they know oh well yeah this is how i'm this is this is the environment this is what people are doing around me this is what happened before my line this is what happens after my line this is how i should be feeling because i can't um, I don't direct people, meaning I don't have six people in a room and everybody's reading their lines just one right after the other. 
I'm literally having to take lines written or, or read from people across the country and then putting them together. And sometimes there's a jarring difference between the way one person reads their lines versus the way another person reads theirs. Mm -hmm. So, so you either have to figure out how to make it work or you just have to send it back and say, Hey, can you do these for me again? I've, I've been lucky. I rarely ask for retakes. Um, there's only been a few times where I've had just absolutely, I, I wouldn't say horrible, I, but, but the lines just didn't come in in a way that I could even begin to use them. And, and actually one of them was because whatever mic they were using, it sounded like they were like in a submarine. It was just so muddled and I could not reduce, or I, I couldn't reduce anything enough to make them even, even usable. So I finally came up with the idea of, oh, they're on a radio. So, so they were originally supposed to be talking to somebody and I actually put them on a walkie talkie and I was like, oh, that, that, that works. Perfect. That works. Yeah. yeah. So. Oh, all right, folks. Um, this is going to be our mid break moment. So I'm going to go ahead and say thank you for listening to the show and thank you all my Patreon listeners for your support. If you have not yet and would like to please follow, like, subscribe, and be sure to write a review of our show. Also send us an email with your comments and questions at creator, excuse me, ccreatorsguide at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter at ccreatorsguide. And we'll be right back after this message and a short clip of today's talent. Friendly reminder, board game Tuesdays are no laughing matter. Would you like to kind of set me up today's showcase clip? Yeah, so the clip that I'm going to, that we'll be listening to, or that you may just have already heard, um, is going to be from the Halloween episode that we just did um, this past year. And it's a little bit different than the standard Modus files, but it is, takes place in the same universe. It's actually called the, uh, from the Journal of Bethany Miller. And it is a story of a group of scavengers that end up going down into a mine where they really shouldn't have. Um, so the, uh, the character, there's only one character in here. You'll hear, uh, Bethany Miller is actually played by Vitriol Plays, uh, actually from Once Upon a Wasteland, and she is absolutely awesome. Um, so you'll, uh, you'll hear a couple of minutes of her and, uh, hopefully this gives you a sense of, of not only my writing style, but just the atmosphere that I try to go for in most of my, uh, most of my productions. Excellent. All right, let's watch the clip. October 31st, 2104, I think. If anyone should ever find this journal, please, if you value your life and your sanity, run, run as far away from here as you can. There is no gold, no treasure, only lies, greed, and something far, far worse. I'm going to die here. My name was Bethany Miller, but everyone just called me B. I came to Appalachia months ago. Everyone talked about gold and striking it rich. My husband George and I had nothing to lose up north, so we came. Getting over the mountains was hard. We lost some good people to raiders, but then a group of vaulters chased them off. We set up camp near this place called The Wayward. Nice folks, and everybody was talking about some gold and some big vault. We spent half our caps on some stupid map that just led right up to Vault 76. I could have killed George. Had to take whatever work we could find. And that led us directly to Tom and his scabber crew. Not bad guys, at least not at first. Tom made his living pulling ore out of the old mines. By the time we got there, most of the easy scores were gone, so we'd headed south with them to a place called the Ash Heap. Got chased out of a few places by these weird-looking people wearing cloaks and strange gas masks. They killed a few of our crew, too. That was scary. Or at least what I thought scary was. Oh, okay. So, uh, what went through your head when coming up with, uh, with your show name? So 
You know, that's a really interesting question. And I don't think I've given it as much thought because it was, I don't want to say it was the easiest thing to come up with, but I really want, I mean, Modus actually is probably the heart of the story. Mm -hmm. And coming up with the title, I thought, well, what's something catchy? What's something that someone's going to remember? And, you know, I, I actually looked at some other podcast titles and played around a little bit. And after two or three variations, I was like, yeah, Modus Files, that that sounds that sounds pretty good. Um, now, I, of course, when I grew up, X-Files was the big show that was on TV. Um, so it kind of harkened back a little bit to that. But, you know, that's really kind of where it came from. It's I mean, I wanted to highlight Modus. Obviously, the podcast cover art really highlights the fact that he is kind of the character in your face mm -hmm. um, and then really and then built around that. So that's where that's actually where it came from was really just looking back into my childhood, but then also, you know, what was going to roll off the tongue as well. Cool. So now I get to my stranger questions. No, not really strange, but um, what do you think is a question that new content creators fail to ask somebody that's experienced? And of course, what do you think the answer to that question should be? Um, I mean, I'm trying to think about questions that I should have asked at the beginning. Right. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a pondering kind of question, obviously. I mean, actually, so, so certain things are... Um, what should be your release schedule? What, like how, how often should you be putting out content? Right. I think is a question that I should have asked at the beginning. And I think the answer is, what do you feel like you can handle? Because it's so easy to fall into the trap of, I have to get another episode out, or I have to do another stream, or I have to do another video. And you end up burning yourself out because this is the fun not out of it, right? Oh, th this, the moment that it becomes a job is the time when you as a creator, your, your passion starts to die because mm -hmm. it is what you are doing, you're doing because you should want to be doing it, not because you have to. So I would say that definitely you need to ask yourself that question, which is how often do I want to be doing this? And that way you actually not only are setting expectations for yourself, but you're setting appropriate expectations for your audience. Because if your audience expects that you're going to put out once a month, that's great. Then that gives you leeway and, and you can work on it in your spare time. And then you have your release schedule. But if you've set the expectation that they're going to get one or two videos a week or an episode a week or whatever, that you can create a lot of disappointment when you suddenly aren't able to meet that schedule. Now, another thing too, is you need to ask yourself, the release schedule then leads to what is your commitment in creating all of this? Right. Because, well, and also, what are you doing? Because I mean, in your case, you're making stories, so right. you need kind of that ability to have that time to think about things. Now, right. in the in the case of say, like the Fallout Roundtable, which is one of the podcasts I co-host for, um, we put out content every two weeks. That way, we can create a moment where we can have like a one once a week um, like meeting to discuss what we're doing, and then the week after that, on the same day, is our release day. So we have that to where we have a a rotating schedule that works for us, but also gives us enough time to think and create. Right. Right. Um, also I would all, a question that I know has actually tripped up other creators. What is your definition of success? Right. What to, yeah. And that, that is a very difficult question because the only person that can answer that question is going to be you. Mm -hmm. So for instance, my definition of success is that my son is my biggest fan. <laughs> um, my youngest son, the moment I put out an episode, he immediately runs upstairs, pulls out his tablet and starts listening to the episode. Um, to me, that's my definition of, of success. Everything else that I've managed to accomplish is gravy on top of that, because my goal at the end of the day was to tell a really compelling story. I had no expectations of how many people were going to listen, um, how people, you know, would people like it even? I mean, Yes, I'm glad that they do, but at the end of the day, that's not really what's driving the conversation. I love the fact that the community has embraced this, and I will continue to do this. But at the end of the day, my motivation is my is my family, is my son, and and the fact that he is my number one fan. But you, as a creator, you know, is it number of downloads? Is it the number of people viewing your stream? Is it you know how you define success? is going to help you stay motivated because what you don't want to do is you don't want to set an unreasonable expectation and say, well, I need to get 10,000 downloads out of my first episode or I'm a failure. That is, that is not helpful. And 
again, it, you just have to go back and look at what's important to you and why you're doing this. Because, you know, I think a lot of, in a lot of cases, people have, I don't want to say bad motivations, but they, but they haven't set themselves up for success because they're, they're literally making it so that they can't achieve what they have set out for themselves. Yeah, well, so I, so yeah, so I would say just be reasonable. I think that's, that's another key question, um, that you, that you as a creator need to be able to answer for yourselves. Yeah. I mean, I'm not completely outside of, you know, for me, part of it is financial because I would like to supplement my income, but at the same time, I want to do it doing something that I love to do. And one of the main things I like to do is have conversations with brilliant people like yourself. You know, that's, <laughs> For me, that's what I, that's what drives me. I love to have conversations with people and I love to get new information and I like to share that information with others. And so if I can supplement my income by doing the same things, you know, I'm obviously going to do so, but I'm not going to make the income part of it drive the situation. You know, it's got to be about the content first and how I feel as a person doing it. Otherwise I would just continue doing what I do you know, as a normal job so to speak you know but i hate that job i can't stand it you know so <laughs> i'm gonna find something that i love doing and i love doing this i love having conversations with people i love doing voice acting all the above so i understand the motivational elements there that's for sure what do you have coming up next and how can people reach you yeah certainly so you know we've so we're in the middle of our second season um, had a very successful first season, and we are actually now transitioning into what I would like to say is going to become an annual annual thing of having a mini series um, of stories that's going to fall in the middle of our main story. So we've been following our main characters. Last year we had uh, the main story, plus we had what we called the last days of Appalachia, which was the the telling of the stories of what happened before we leave the vault. So you know, people that aren't familiar with the story of Fallout seventy six. Um, we were inside a vault safe while well, there was a lot of stuff happening outside in Appalachia. We come out of the vault and discover that everybody's dead because of this thing called the Scorch Plague. And as part of the story, we have to deal with that. It was important to me to tell the stories of the people who were here before. You know, why did they die? What happened? Um, you know, so I would encourage you to go listen to that mini series. It was a great one. Um, what's coming up now is, is a, a mini series that I'm calling Bedtime Stories. And again, kind of looking back to the past, I didn't want our characters to just appear out of thin air. Uh, so they were in this vault for 25 years before it opened. So it focuses on one character, each episode from our, our podcast, The Modus Files. And it's gonna be telling like something that happened in that vault that, that created their persona, um, something that they experienced that leads them to do what they do, you know, in the real world. So that episode, um, which is episode one of Bedtime Stories, which is going to be called Valeria, uh, will be coming out next week. Uh, episode eight, um, which actually I'm very happy, our host here is uh, is actually playing the character of Beckett in the next four episodes that we have, which are called The Blood Eagle, or, uh, the Blood Eagle War. Um, absolutely going to be a, a fantastic story. Uh, very happy to tell that, uh, to tell that and show that to everybody as well. Um, and then as far as where you can find us, uh, Modus Files is available on all uh, current, oh, um, almost all of the podcast platforms, Spotify, iTunes, Google Apps. Um, Audible. Uh, Audible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just uh, just pretty much if you go into Google and, and type in Modus Files, we're like the, the second or third one that comes up. In fact, I think in most cases, we're the first one that comes up. Um, our website is easy. It's just modusfiles.com. Um, we're extremely active on Twitter. Uh, you can follow us there at Modus Files, uh, where we talk about the podcast, we talk about the community, um, we do a lot of art shares. Um, we've done a quite a bit of art for the podcast, so we we try to share that as well. Um, and then, of course, we're always looking for talent. We're looking for voice actors, so we try to use Twitter as a means to reach out and find those. Um, we have a couple of discords. Um, I actually don't know how to invite people to Discord myself. I'm a, <laughs> I'm an old fogey, um, but uh, but yes, you uh, if you need to, you can reach out to us on Twitter there. But um, but yeah, you know it is. There are not that many of these audio drama type podcasts, especially in the Fallout community. So having something like this and being able to tell this type of story is is important to us. And I would hope that it would actually be an encouragement to other creators who want to 
build something around an IP that they love, whether it's Mass Effect, whether it's Cyberpunk, whether it's uh, Elden Ring. If you are experiencing a story kind of in your own mind and you want to articulate that to other people, I will say the doing it in a podcast is actually a very rewarding way to do so because you are able to not only write, but you're actually able to speak. And if you do actually ever want to build a cast, there are a ton of really great people out there to interact with. And I've been, I think, very blessed by the fact that the cast and crew that I have assembled and that and people I interact with just on a on a semi even a semi regular basis have been absolutely fantastic. I could not have done any of this without all of them. As much as I am a creator, um, I am merely kind of the director. It is the people that I work with that make all of this possible. So yeah, um, that's probably the most rewarding part of all of this. Um, oh, that beyond editing, just, though, that definitely makes oh, a serious play the, there. <laughs> the, edit, the, the editing, the editing part of it is difficult, and I, you know, but at the same time, that I, is a huge contribution that a lot of others do not want to have to deal with. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, no, no, that's absolutely no, that's true. But I think yeah. it's again, I think that there's there are so many stories out there to be told, and I I would highly encourage anyone that is interested to investigate it, talk to your peers, talk to people that have been doing it like myself. And, uh, and then certainly we can see where it goes from there. All right. And then uh, my last question for today is what key takeaway would you like the listeners to get from your time here? Passion that, uh, that this is a, this is a passion project. I'm doing this because I want to do it, not because I have to. And it's important to me. And that is something that has helped me survive COVID. Um, more importantly, I think it has connected me to the wider community in a way that I never saw, never thought was possible. Um, I think a lot of times we think that there's a lot of toxicity out there, but I would reject that. And I always treat people as I want to be treated. I would say that using this as an opportunity to embrace a community of people where you can have reasonable and rational conversations and exchange ideas and stories in an open and transparent manner is extremely important to all of us. So for me, the takeaway has been a reconnection to the world and an understanding of me also just being a better person mm. um, because I have a chance to exchange those ideas. I agree totally. Yeah. Uh, if it wasn't for me finding the Robots Radio Network, um, which is partially what brought all of us together was finding robots, you know, being part of that <laughs> network, that his community that he created, the robots radio.net, you know, that whole community was created basically through him. And, uh, without that, I wouldn't have found Chad. I wouldn't have found you. I wouldn't, you know, there's so many other things that I wouldn't have been able to be part of if I didn't find that community and how tight knit we are. And, uh, I think it's, been a huge benefit to my faith in humanity being restored <laughs> uh, but yeah um so I, once again i would like to say thank you lawrence for giving me your time it was a pleasure to have you and uh everybody please go and check out his shows he's got a lot of things out there and more to come uh all right folks that's gonna do it for today i hope you enjoyed the show be sure to check out my guest's work and uh keep creating Bye-bye. This podcast is part of the Robots Radio Rocket Club, a program designed to help all podcasts reach their full potential. For information about joining the Robots Radio Rocket Club, check out robotsradio.net.